from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, so we'll jump into our session here. Um, I hope everyone's enjoying themselves. Uh, my name is Trevor Owens. I work with the NDIP program at the Library of Congress. And um, I'm excited in this panel, we'll hear about some uh, quite literally astronomical challenges. And I had to make a terrible <laughs> pun about astronomical. Um, but no, we have a series of talks about uh, three very different uh, projects we're looking at uh, long-term access to uh, space data, extraterrestrial data. And so in this case, I will briefly introduce our speakers and then they will, um, oh, we've, got, we've got all four here, um, great. So uh, I'll briefly introduce our speakers. We have most of the slides queued up here and we'll just swap them in quick as we go. Um, and then we should have some time at the end for discussion. So uh, first we'll hear from Dr. Rama Priyan. Uh, who is the Assistant Project Manager for the Earth Science Data and Information System Project at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Then we'll hear from Dr. Deirdre Byrne, in the, who is in the Surface Oceanography Unit Supervisor at the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration Satellite Team and lead at NOAA, the National uh, Ocean... Okay. okay, you'll do it. <laughs> I'm s I, I work for the government too. We have complicated job titles. There's a lot of pieces to them. All of, all, all of the presenters are going to talk about their work, in which case their uh, specific uh, vitae's will come out rather directly. And then we have, so those are two uh, talks from federal partners working on uh, ensuring long-term access to space data. And then Emily Frieda Shaw, digital preservation librarian at University of Iowa Libraries to talk about a project and Carl Nielsen and Robin Dassler, um, research data librarians with the University of Maryland Libraries, will talk about um, a, a project at UMD. And then lastly, uh, Vivek Naval from the National Archives will moderate discussion between them. So I think what's particularly uh, interesting and, and neat about having these talks set together is we have two folks working in federal agencies, sort of directly working with ensuring access to space data, and two folks, or well, three folks working on two projects at research libraries, university research libraries, um, working with uh, varying astronomical data sets from uh, different points in time. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Rama. Thank you very much, Trevor. <coughs> And good morning to you all. Uh, I had a very exciting time here this morning listening to a couple of very um, uh, creative uh, people uh, giving talks. And given th those kinds of talks, this may sound a little mundane, even though it is space-related program, it's very exciting. Um, so let me go on. So uh, I come from a project that's responsible for collecting, archiving, and distributing a lot of data that pertains to Earth observations. So why does NASA do this? Uh, NASA's role is to, one of, the, one of the things, one of the statements in the NASA 2014 strategic plan says, we need to advance knowledge of Earth as a system to meet challenges of environmental change and to improve life on our planet. So uh, NASA's Earth Science Data Systems play a very important role in supporting this objective by providing end-to-end -end capabilities to deliver data and information products to users. And uh, NASA has, a, an, has an open and free data policy and it promotes usage of data by a large community. There is no period of exclusive access, which means data are available as soon as the satellites are launched and instruments start collecting the data. And there is a period of initial checkout, which may last a couple of months, maybe three to six months. After that, the data are available uh, and there is no period of exclusive access. P 
PIs of instruments don't hold on to their data until they milk the data for their own publications and then release the data. It's the, it's, a, it's a no period of exclusive access policy. And data are available at no cost to all users on a non-discriminatory basis except where agreed upon with international partners. We do deal with international partners uh, from Europe and Japan and Canada and uh, other countries. And if we have an agreement with them that says we're going to hold on to the data and we're going to charge for those data, we do. But otherwise, data are available at no cost to all users. Uh, the acronym eos DIS stands for Earth Observing System Data and Information System, and it is a core, key core capability in NASA's Earth Science Data Systems Program. Uh, eos DIS provides end-to-end -end capabilities for managing NASA's Earth Science data from satellites, aircraft, field measurements, and various uh, aircraft, field measurements, and various other programs. And uh, eos DIS provides science operations, uh, which includes data processing, data management, interoperable, distributed data archives, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, and online, online data access services. Uh, most of our data are online, uh, so uh, we provide online data access services, and uh, earth science discipline-oriented user services, which means there are individuals, people at our um, archive centers uh, who answer questions with some familiarity with the uh, utility of the data and how the data have been produced and access to actual scientists who are, who can answer further detailed questions. And we of course also need to provide network for uh, transporting data to distributed system elements. So uh, what kind of data do we archive and distribute? They are coming from various satellites. This. Uh, uh, figure shows multiple satellites that have been launched and are operating currently. And also aircraft data, as shown in the uh, right corner here. Uh, that's only one example of aircraft mission, and there are a large number of those that uh, have a number of instruments on board aircraft, and the aircraft campaigns are conducted. Also, uh, field experiments, uh, which are ground-based or ocean-based measurements, are done as well. And the intention of this picture is also to show that the multiple disciplines like um, ocean biology and ocean surface topography and uh, sea surface winds, uh, temperature, moisture, you know, atmospheric properties, land properties, and ocean properties, all kinds of uh, measurements of the Earth are being taken by various satellite instruments and aircraft instruments and uh, Earth-borne or uh, ground-based instruments. Uh, we are a very distributed system. We have 12 different archives where data are stored, and the archives are called DACs, or Distributed Active Archive Centers, and there are 12 of them. There are four of them locally at uh, Garter Space Flight Center in Maryland, and you've got uh, one in Alaska, one in Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, JPL at, uh, in Pasadena, California, and so on. So there are 12 of these. and. Uh, we process data from 10 different satellite missions. Archiving and distribution is done from 38 missions, instrument product support for 87 different instruments. These are all, these numbers change over time. These are uh, current as of uh, end of FY13. And we had 6,861 unique different products. And we had 1.7 million users around the world. And in 2013, we distributed 839 million products to this uh, large community. So we are very active as an archive. And uh, the, uh, the first of the satellites that we were responsible for got launched, in, launched in at the end of uh, 1999. And since then, the number of products distributed to the community has been increasing uh, somewhat exponentially, as you can see from this curve. and uh, in FY14, I think we're going to exceed a billion quite easily, looking at the trend. As far as preservation is concerned, which is what this meeting is all about, NASA is not designated by Congress as a preservation agency, permanent archiving agency. But that doesn't mean we can throw away our data. 
we need to maintain. We spend billions of dollars collecting the data and processing them. And so we do need to maintain them for posterity. Uh, we need to maintain a research archive as long as, uh, as, long as there is uh, scientific research interest and, uh, and, we need to trans and, and we need to transition the responsibility to those are agencies that do have permanent archiving responsibility. Uh, research archive responsibilities, of course, persist well beyond lives of missions. A satellite may last 10 years or 15 years or something like that, but the interest in uh, uh, research, earth science research, is going to extend way beyond that, maybe of the order of 50 to 60 years. And NASA works with other, other agencies for long-term preservations. We need to cut agreements and uh, uh, decide what kind of data we need to transition and what and so on. Uh, so NASA has to ensure data and other critical items are preserved and made available to the permanent archiving agencies. So in terms of general requirements of preservation, we shouldn't lose bits. We need to maintain discoverability and accessibility, readability, understandability, uh, usability, and reproducibility of results. I've probably forgotten some abilities, but uh, they, they need to be there. Okay, so uh, for this reason, NASA recently developed preservation content specifications for Earth science data, which includes a list of all the things that you need to keep. It's not enough if you just keep the bits. You need to maintain the understandability and readability and so on. Therefore, you need to keep other content. What are those content? That's what the content specifications document addresses. And NASA also participates in the Earth Science Information Partners uh, or ESIT Data Stewardship Committee on an emerging provenance and context content standard. Uh, so it's actually the preservation content specification was derived out of the, some work that we did with the ESIT Federation. So this gives you an example of the categories of content that need to be preserved, like pre-flight, pre-operations, anytime you, you launch, uh, yeah, anytime you launch uh, satellite, you, before that you have pre-flight and uh, uh, pre-flight operations, operational data. Science data products, of course, need to be preserved. Science data product documentation, mission data calibration, science data product software, science data product algorithm input, uh, product validation, science data software tools, and so on. So all these things need to be preserved, and the document provides a lot more detail on what exactly needs to be preserved and why. And uh, that's it for now. While the talk is loading, I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Deirdre, and I made the mistake of um, assuming that the red line would run on its posted schedule. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's one of these fora where I can, you know, confess my sins. Um, so I'm, I'm Dr. Deirdre Byrne. I work at the National Oceanographic Data Center, which is part of NOAA. Um, and we, we are one of the nation's designated permanent archives for science data. Um, so I would love to say that we have a, an integrated plan with NASA to um, inherit these data when the 50-year mark are reached. Um, this could be interesting. It's a um, little slow. It's a little slow. Yeah. Okay. Um, but um, that effort has never been funded, so we're not really sure what's going to happen. We, we have roughly comparably sized archives of, of space data um, between NASA and NOAA. Um, so. I'm going to talk about the levels of archival stewardship, which is really, it's a conceptual model about um, how we organize our work, which came out of, I came into NOAA in 2010 from a, I was a research professor, and um, there was a, a gap in leadership above me, and I was kind of left on my own for a while, and I sort of went around the Oceanographic Data Center saying, well, what, what are other people doing, and what should my group be doing? How should we organize ourselves, and, and what should we give priority to? And this has actually turned out to be 
I'm getting this weird feedback. Um, widely applicable across our, our center, so we now use it. So um, I'm going to talk about scientific data stewardship. And I was, I was trying this morning, actually, while I was stuck on the red line, to think about how I characterize the differences um, between them. But I think one of the things that we, we often take for granted and we don't elucidate is that um, scientific data stewardship um, really requires human interaction to a high degree and perhaps a, a higher degree than um, archive of textual information because it is so specialized. It is completely useless without an expert to interpret it for you. So very much of what we do involves interacting with the data to try and retain that expertise for the long term on behalf of our nation and the world. Um, so we have application of an integrated suite of functions that enable the full value of the data to be preserved and exploited over the long term. Our minimum default preservation horizon is 75 years or as long as the data shall remain scientifically um, significant and useful. So I tend to think that's as long as we shall have people on the earth. Um, it's a very long time horizon. Um, so there are five things that you need to have. Basically, you need to document the data and preserve it. You need to have provenance that comes under digital preservation. You need to provide IT support so that you can um, maintain the integrity. You can provide access in flexible ways that evolve over time. Um, you also, but you also need to be able to work with the data. So that, that's like one step, which is why I labeled that as digital preservation plus. You need to assess and ensure data quality. This is the driest part of my talk, I assure you. Um, <laughs> you need to engage with the scientific community that the best understanding is applied to the data. Um, and that requires subject matter expertise and you need continuity over the long term and you need, of course, to pay attention to your media and um, things like that. So this is the conceptual model that, that I came up with um, when I was casting about for what do we do and what do we do about it. And really the, the archival part, the curatorship, is the very bottom level and then much of our other activities are built on top of that. So we have long-term preservation and access and I'm going to walk through these with examples. We have tailored access which is, um, tends to be, uh, I think, a little more heavily emphasized in the science world because we have very large data sets, right? We're talking about hundreds of terabytes size data sets. I think um, last time I heard NASA has about 13 petabytes on hand and we have about 11 in NOAA. So, I mean, these are massive um, collections of data. Scientific quality assessments, deriving products usually out of aggregates of data that would not necessarily be available to individual researchers around the world building climate data records, that's long-term connected series of stuff, and then various things on the national service level. So, and these are organized in um, requiring in increasing subject matter expertise. So this was based on the NDSA levels of digital preservation. I actually went, sat down with our lead archivist who is trained in information science, unlike me, and said, you know, how, how do we come out on this scale? Um, because I, I do, I work with this, but I do tend to take it on faith that the people who have formal training in this are doing their job and it's, it's done right. Um, so um, we've got some, some areas to improve, particularly in formats and um, geographic location. I don't think we maintain three copies of everything. So um, to level one, we bring in data and we have checksums and we make sure that it, it is actually preserved. Um, typically it goes to two geographic locations. Um, it's replicated on tape, it's kept on spinning disk if we think it's valuable enough. The, the next thing we do is try and provide tailored access and by that I mean you have hundreds of terabytes and you want just a slice or you're studying one particular geographic area. How do we provide that to you? So we spend a lot of time thinking about this. Another thing that we do is a lot of automated quality monitoring. Um, NOAA has 17 satellites in the air right now. Some of those are on standby because we're an operational agency so they're, they're replicates of each other and they're just waiting. Um, but many of them are actually operating and one of the things we need to know is, you know, was there a calibration slip in 2011? And we need to be able to present that to people succinctly so you can see the little arrow that uh, I have there shows in fact where there was a calibration slip in one of our satellites that's flying now. And in um, the plot on the left it shows you there was actually, there's a missing chunk of data and you'd be able to go back to the logs and find out why that happened um, because it might affect the science you're trying to do. Um, the next thing we try to do is actually, if you have a bunch of measurements that are the same type, what can you do? Um, so one of the things that quickly becomes apparent, particularly with in situ data that we collect, is not so, well, actually, I'll take that back. One of the things that becomes apparent when you have collections of data, thank you, is um, you have biases. So you may have a particular class of instruments that was deployed and then somebody whatever company comes up with the new model and it turns out actually that there's a, there's, there's a measurement bias between the two and this is a picture of one 
Um, this is a, an ocean profile, but the same thing hap happens with satellites, and typically we handle that by having satellites overlap in time. We launch one before the last one fails. That's not always possible, but that's the intent. Um, and another thing you can do when you have loads and loads of data, as opposed to being an individual researcher with just one collection, is you can, you can characterize a piece of data in relation to a very large aggregate. Is it typical? Is it atypical? That again gives you more insight into um, the significance of the measurement and what may be going on. The next thing that we do with the data is actually create aggregated products. And again, this is all um, oriented toward providing enhanced access. Many researchers do not have the technical know-how or the IT infrastructure to handle, you know, the 21 million temperature profiles that we um, have on hand, for example, or the 17 satellite missions. So we do things like make climatologies for them. So if you're a fisheries, state fisheries manager, stock assessment manager, you might be able to go in and get one of our climatologies and you could then take your most recent survey and you could characterize it with respect to the long-term mean because we've provided that long-term mean. So we do a lot of that um, kind of activity. Um, at the next level up, we create um, records that are de facto standards. Sometimes they're officially sanctioned standards. We have one uh, that we produce which is an official NOAA climate data record. It's called Pathfinder Sea Surface Temperature, and it's based on the intercalibration of advanced, very high radiation, advanced, very high radiometer something from eight satellites. I, if I was going a little slower, I could do it. But um, so we've intercalibrated eight different satellites to make a 31-year time series of global sea surface temperature, which is um, it's a really important environmental record for everything from coral bleaching to fish stocks to um, water quality along the coast. It's, it's used, it is, it is, it was before it was declared as an officially sanctioned climate data record, it was a de facto standard for many municipalities, cities, states, and nations. Um, and at the highest level, we provide national service. An example of this would be at our, our sister um, permanent archive, the National Climatic Data Center. They make the climate normals when the weather service comes out and says, the summer exceeds, you know, any records and is, you know, three standard deviations higher than the climate normal, they're the ones who actually went through and took 30 years of weather data and decided what, what's the average, what is our average weather across the nation. So um, one of the things that we do is um, the scientific community has kind of come around uh, a format called NetCDF as a standard, um, and there are a couple of um, conventions that are very widely used, thank you, um, called uh, Climate and Forecast Compliance and attribute conventions for data set discovery. So we take those and we um, basically have said, well, there are eight different kinds of oceanographic data that you might have, and here is a template. If you're going to submit data to us um, and you use this template, we can ensure that it will be widely understandable, widely discoverable, and able to be supported by a lot of automated protocols that we have. Um, this is an example, um, more on the IT level, of what automated protocols we support. Um, file transfer protocol, hypertext transfer protocol, most people don't even know what that means. Um, data access protocol, that's a very um, wonderful way of slicing and dicing your data and our average data set that someone comes in and, and uses that protocol to access is about 100 times larger than our average data set in whole and they're usually subsampling something like one ten, ten thousandth of it. So it's, it lets you pinpoint what you want. Um, we have a live access server, we support GIS, um, we support Google Earth with KML layers, web coverage service, web mapping service, all of these different kinds of services. Again, it's, it's a way to let the community access the data in the way that they're familiar and comfortable with it so that they can spend their time doing the best interpretation of the data. Um, and that's just a cute graphical view of um, our GeoPortal, which becomes a platform for all these different services um, that we deploy. And thank you very much. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Emily Shaw. 
I am the digital preservation librarian at the University of Iowa Libraries. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today uh, and have an opportunity to talk to you all a bit about the work that I and my colleagues have been doing at the University of Iowa um, and to provide some context for the very interesting content that we've been working with. Um, I've affectionately nicknamed this project the Shot in the Dark Project uh, because this turn of phrase conveys some of the hopeful uncertainty of both our recent efforts at the University of Iowa Libraries and those of the late 1950s Iowa-based research team whose scientific legacy we are working to steward. So, Iowa. <laughs> the first thing most people think of is probably corn, maybe caucuses, and perhaps the future birthplace of, Jap of James Tiberius Kirk. You might not immediately think of landlocked Iowa as a seat of the U.S. space program, though last year's announcement by University of Iowa professor and plasma physicist uh, Don Gurnett that Voyager 1 had reached interstellar space has helped to correct that perception somewhat. Iowans have a pioneering spirit and history of exploration and not just of the land west of the Mississippi River. In 1958, a few years before NASA came into existence, a team of researchers from the University of Iowa helped to make one of the first major scientific discoveries of the space age. Launched on the last day of 1958, Explorer 1 was an aptly named rocket. Developed in collaboration with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Army Ballistic Missiles Agency, and the Naval Research Laboratory, Explorer 1 was the first U.S. satellite to be put into orbit around the Earth as part of the International Geophysical Year. Explorer's research team was based in Iowa City at the State University of Iowa, now called simply the University of Iowa. The team was led by Professor of Physics and Astronomy, Dr. James Van Allen, and comprised of an impressive group of research graduate assistants, including Drs. George Ludwig and Carl Michael Lane and others. Personal journals and correspondence um, uh, of jo uh, George Ludwig, pictured here uh, second from the right, revealed that the launch of Explorer 1 was a bit rushed. As we all know, the Soviets had beaten the U.S. into, uh, into space, having launched Sputnik um, in October of the previous year, 1957. Explorer was designed to measure cosmic radiation as a function of altitude, latitude, longitude, and time. It had a number of different instruments on board. However, it had no onboard data logger. This tape recorder, developed specifically for the Explorer rockets, was not ready in time for Explorer 1's launch. It was finished soon thereafter and sent into orbit uh, aboard Explorer 3, which was uh, launched in July of that year, so not, not too far after. The data from Explorer 1 was captured at receiving stations around the Earth, noted by name on this map of Explorer's um, orbital path. Each station operator was told when Explorer was scheduled to pass overhead so that they could turn on their reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and record the data transmitted telemetrically by the satellite as it passed by. Each tape recorded up to 15 minutes of audio data and recorded data uh, from up to seven channels on seven tracks. After each recording window closed uh, and when Explorer had moved out of range, the station operator packed up the tape and sent it to Iowa for analysis. These are the actual tapes, this one from Quito. Um, back in Iowa City, uh, each Explorer tape was played back and the data was printed out into graphs that look like this. Um, each second of data was represented by one centimeter. Uh, so a 15 minute recording could produce a paper graph nine meters long, about 30 feet. Uh, many of these graphs persist in the university archives, um, figuring out if and how to digitize them and present them for screen delivery has been a bit perplexing. A small army of Iowa students helped to convert these graphs into numerical data could, that could then be computed. Um, and while analyzing the data from Explorer 1, a curious anomaly emerged. At certain altitudes, the radiation data fell to zero. In the absence of data, in that noise, lay the big discovery. By the time Expl the Explorer 1 data was fully analyzed, Explorer 3 was already in orbit and with more sensitive instrumentation. Explorer 3 confirmed what the data gaps in Explorer 1 suggested. The existence of large belts of charged particles surrounding the Earth, soon thereafter dubbed the Van Allen radiation belts. Dr. Van Allen and his research team captured the imagination of the American public. Um, Dr. Van Allen is pictured here in his research lab um, explaining his discovery to Walter Cronkite. 
Uh, this discovery had a significant impact on the development of te telecommunications and for manned and unmanned space exploration. So what happened to all of the tapes? As the all too familiar story goes, the tapes went into a basement where they sat for decades, no longer useful for active research, but too important to throw away and with no permanent archival home. So fast forward to 2009, Special Collections at the University of Iowa got a phone call from a facilities manager of a building on campus that used to house Dr. Van Allen's research labs. He wanted to let the libraries know about several thousand musty smelling tapes in the basement, some with the words explore and vanguard written on their boxes and cans. Unfortunately, the basement storage area had minimal environmental controls. There was significant mold growth, including the cardboard, Ampex, and Scotch tape boxes, and many of the tapes themselves. On a campus still reeling from massive flooding the previous year, an emergency grant from the state of Iowa was secured to clean, rehouse, and move the tapes into the main library. Two years later, when I was hired as the library's first digital preservation librarian, one of the first projects assigned to me was to secure funding and get the Explorer One data tapes digitized. A generous grant from the Iowa-based Carver Foundation was given to the libraries to do this work, to digitize the tapes, and to share the data and associated archival materials with the public. The libraries would make the full data set available to scientists to analyze contemporary tools and methods and weave an engaging narrative of early space exploration at Iowa for members of the general public. Our friends at the Media Preserve managed to track down a machine very similar to the original, uh, the one that was originally used to read the data. Um, the head of audio engineering here, Heath Kondiat, um, converted the audio signals into wave files, producing about 1.5 terabytes, including all the metadata and derivatives for about 700 tapes. Um, and that's as many as there were, as far as we could tell. Um, as our project team assembled at the University of Iowa Libraries, one thing became immediately clear. None of the librarians and staff who normally work on digital projects like this, myself absolutely included, so please keep this in mind during the Q&A, None of us had any expertise in near-Earth research, near-Earth physics, rather. Uh, so we reached out to our colleagues in the physics department, um, who now work and conduct the research out of Van Allen Hall. Uh, the partnership has been invaluable. Our colleagues in physics have been tremendously enthusiastic about our efforts to preserve the legacy of their field and of their department. They've helped us track down Explorer One's orbital ephemeris data set, which was digitized by Google from the collections of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and is now preserved in Hathi Trust. Um, which we learned is uh, critical to interpreting the audio data recorded on the tapes. So the data is digital. Now what? Um, oops. So uh, the machine that was used and the original machine. Um, our work with this data is very much in progress. Uh, with guidance from our colleagues in the physics department, uh, we plan to prepare the audio data and ephemeris data set to be archived with the National um, Space Science Data Center um, by packaging it in the common data format. Um, we're also working with a professor of journalism and Ben Allen biographer to weave an engaging narrative. Um, lab notebooks and personal journals will be made available for crowdsourced transcription through the library's DIY history platform. And our work with this data raises many interesting questions without easy answers. Um, archiving and sharing research data is a really hot topic in research libraries um, and research spheres. And libraries are struggling to figure out what our role is and how to make a meaningful impact without necessarily having the expertise, the scientific cred, or the infrastructure to do so. Um, by claiming the digitized research data as part of our archival collections, we've committed to preserving this product of faculty research in perpetuity. Um, so what do we do, what do we do now if, the, if, these, if these tapes uh, had not, if we had not digitized these tapes, what would happen to them? We learned recently that there was a warehouse full of tapes that had been destroyed about three years ago on our campus. What would we have done if we had found those? We don't know what they contain. We know that uh, Explorer One hinted at a very important scientific discovery, but we're not certain about the scientific usefulness of that particular data set. It has a lot of historical value. Um, so I'm gonna just leave you with those questions that we can hopefully explore a little bit more in the Q&A um, and play you a little clip from one of them. I hope this is not too loud. This is Blossom Point, Maryland, uh, recording the, ninth, the run of the 1958 Epsilon predicted our station at 0538 Google time. It 
it's not easy listening. Former library director called this the Beeps in Space project. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Robin Dassler. I'm the engineering and research data librarian at the University of Maryland, just up the green line in College Park. And this is my colleague, Carl Nielsen, who's the research data librarian uh, there as well. Um, so we're going to talk to you a little bit today um, about preserving a relational database for extra galactic distances. So first off, Carl and I are at part of a group at the University of Maryland that we are is currently dubbed Research Data Services. This is an interdisciplinary, uh, cross-functional team in the University of Maryland Libraries. It is made up of people from the public services realm, like myself. The engineering part of my title means that I am a uh, subject liaison. And for, uh, also made up of people in sort of the more ITD realm, like Carl. And we have other people also with our uh, Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities and a bunch of other sort of cross-functional areas in the library. Uh, we're primarily concerned with um, any issues uh, in the library realm that relate to data management, data curation, data publishing, data preservation, and any sort of related topics like that to uh, making research data uh, go for researchers, basically, and to be accessible into the future. So because of this, uh, last year sometime, we were approached by a researcher at the University of Maryland um, who uh, was part of a team that had created this database that called the Extra Galactic uh, Distance Database, or the EDD, the ED. Um, and this is a database that they put together to help determine um, distances to galaxies and distance, distances between galaxies based on a kind of compiling multiple measurements. Um, because galaxies are so far away, it sort of takes a lot to figure out exactly how far away they are because space and time get sort of, you know, fuzzy when you move out into space. Um, and so this is a way for them to kind of gather these multiple measurements together and uh, try to determine these distances. So the data that is in this database is compiled from various data sources. Um, a lot of it is culled directly from astronomy literature, um, and some of it is um, observational data sets from various, uh, various other uh, telescopes and that sort of thing. Um, it is currently uh, running with MySQL. It has sort of a, a file system and, and, and a web application. Uh, to give it sort of a web interface where people can access it. Uh, and it is roughly 500 gigabytes in total, so not super, super big, but not super small either. Um, and you can actually visit it, if you would like, at uh, edd.ifa.hawaii.edu, which is its current home. So this is an example of um, some of the, uh, how you can make some queries in the database. You see the sort of the way its interface looks currently, and there's a bunch of different kinds of uh, measurements that are available there, and you can search by galaxy name. And then this is the kind of results that come back. So you basically just get your big uh, tables related to the galaxies and the measurements of interest. So there were a few different objectives uh, in preserving this database and in making it accessible. And the objectives, of course, varied based on whether you were the, the PIs responsible for this or whether you were a library. So primarily, um, as you did see from the URL, this is currently housed at the University of Hawaii uh, because one of the researchers involved is based out of the University of Hawaii. Um, but uh, there were, the astronomers were basically concerned about their, uh, their work disappearing after they retired was mostly what this was about. So uh, they didn't want their work to disappear into the ether. Uh, they wanted to still be able to be available and have value to people. They didn't want it to wind up, to wind up in a basement somewhere, as other people have talked about. Um, so for them, their goals were really replication of the database and continued access and some form of data peace of mind, some kind of uh, sense that the data would not necessarily be going anywhere for the foreseeable future, though it wouldn't necessarily need to be permanent just until something better came along. 
So on the curator side, on our side, the kinds of stuff we were interested in, of course, were access, uh, continuing to provide access to this resource and letting people be able to use it. Um, we wanted to take on some stewardship of uh, a regularly used reference collection. So that's essentially what this is, is the same thing as a reference collection in your library. That's kind of what this function this serves. And we also thought this would be a really great opportunity to engage in a little bit of curation and preservation R&D kind of related to preserving a database that is both currently still functional and still being added to and uh, that we really wanted to preserve as a database rather than just flattening the information in it and storing it in a different way. So currently, in order to uh, get this going, some of the tasks we have set up for ourselves is we did um, create some, uh, allocate some server space at the University of Maryland. Uh, we set up rsync for an initial uh, transfer and hopefully to get some uh, regular syncing going on a regular basis. Uh, we assemble, uh, we're trying to gather the database, get sort of an initial ingest, um, assemble it and sort of test it uh, on our virtual machine to make sure it's all functional. Um, and then we hope to eventually, once, once that actually works, we're still early days yet, but once that actually works, we make sure that this sort of regular syncing and ingest is going to be, is, uh, has worked out, then we would like to kind of work with it to try to see if we can increase the utility and value of this either through presentation or, um, or uh, other ways to handle the data. Um, and we also would like to then experiment with various database, database preservation strategies and practices, again, for sort of uh, preserving the entire database. So some of our early lessons in this, uh, before I turn over to Carl for the more technical stuff, is um, basically we had to have a lot of discussions that, that were involved in this to determine you know, people's various objectives and how those were going to work together. Um, the researchers were not particularly interested in curation formalities. Uh, like I said, they were interested in having this be accessible and having it be available for sort of uh, a, a near term, long term. Um, but this sort of idea of like formal donation agreements and all this kind of stuff was a little bit foreign and a little strange. Um, and we had some issues with, of course, assessing the long-term research value. We can see its value is from preserving a database standpoint, but we are not astronomers, and so trying to assess what sort of research value it has in the future was, was useful there. Um, and of course, this also provided us a larger um, IT and development role for us as curators um, by bringing on this database that is still, still active. And on that note, Carl will talk a little bit about our preservation challenges. We'll say a few words about database preservation. Uh, this is an area that we've begun to look at and it has some interesting opportunities and challenges of its own. One of the things we observe is that perhaps you could take two different perspectives on database preservation. You could take a sort of format-centric perspective or you could take a system-centric perspective. Uh, or you could do some combination of the two. Uh, I'll we'll say a little bit more about those in a moment. Um, but one of the key observations for us is that the intellectual value of the database is actually in uh, say ad hoc combinations of data from multiple tables. This has to do with the nature of this particular database, but it's the reality of relational databases that the, the intellectual value comes out of things like joins and selections, uh, what we, you know, in other contexts you would call sort of merging and subsetting data. Um, and so as we think about digital preservation for a database, we start to, th we find ourselves thinking more and more about access. Um, so. To say something about format-centric preservation, there could be a number of strategies that you could uh, use. Most database management systems have some capacity to dump out um, uh, data uh, in, into a set of files or a single file, so SQL, uh, CSV, XML. And then uh, at some point later on, the database can reload that back in. There has been some research as well, some very interesting research on uh, uh, tools for doing specifically this kind of work. Uh, the software independent archiving of relational databases is one example. I believe there's a, uh, a talk about this coming up shortly. Uh, and another tool called Database Preservation Toolkit, and these are based, what these do is they export the data from the relational database as uh, XML, and the idea being that at some point in the future, you could load that XML back into a different system. And the extent to which these tools are supported over the long term will in some ways determine um, you know, how much additional parsing might be required to get that XML back into a relational database or whatever uh, database you want to use in the future. Uh, there has been a little bit of research also on taking a relational database, transforming it into RDF, and uh, then uh, using something like Sparkle to query it. So that's a, that's a very interesting direction as well. One of the things we note about this is that the, um, it seems to be fairly straightforward to take a relational database and turn it into a bunch of files that could then be, uh, you know, 
uh, part of an archival package with other files and metadata and so on. Um, the question is, what, what would a dissemination package from the archive then look like? Um, would it be those files? Would it be SQL? Would it be a full uh, application again? Uh, the other perspective that we've been thinking a lot about and we want to look at as well is, is sort of a system-centric perspective where uh, one uh, obvious approach would be something like emulation where we push the, the sort of preservation task up to the system or the environment level. Um, we're not in a position to say much about this at the moment because we've just started to look at it, but it, one of the things to note is that we're going to run this uh, database on a virtual machine and that's in a sense already part of the way towards doing uh, emulation. It's also interesting to note that the Olive Archive, uh, which is a project at Carnegie Mellon, uh, to preserve executable content has the sort of virtual machine as the uh, as its a core concept. Uh, another approach that we are, are interested in is thinking about how access and continuing to provide access is itself a form of preservation and this has a lot to do with the objectives of the researchers in, in uh, asking us to s become stewards of this database. So this would be a case of, of in a sense migrating from one uh, web application to uh, a sort of more modern web application. And so that's in a sense collapsing the, uh, the digital preservation horizon down to something like 10 years at a time. Uh, so that's, that's another strategy. We suspect that we will combine uh, two of those. And our time is up, so we'll wrap up here. Thanks so much. And if you're interested in these topics, we'd be very interested to talk to you. For questions from the audience, so please raise your hand. I can see or locate you. Uh, so any first questions? Or before I have a whole laundry list of my own questions. <laughs> so I, I would like the audience to engage. Yes. Uh, so each of you has very large, oops, sorry. Each of you has very large and very diverse data sets. And so can you talk a little bit about how you come up with controlled vocabulary and metadata structures for how you apply and embed metadata into each of your data sets? Uh, it's a general question to anyone, okay. but uh, I think it would be yeah. useful if it's addressed from big data sets which NASA and NOAA are dealing as well as okay. specialized data sets from your end. Yeah, uh, my project, uh, I didn't mention this before, it got started about 25 years ago. And uh, we came up with, um, there is a system called the EOS Disk Core System, which uh, uh, is a large system. It's common, common software that's used across um, four, three or four uh, uh, distributed acti active archive centers. For the purposes of the uh, Earth observing missions, which are producing you know, multiple terabytes of data, or petabytes of data for us, um, for uh, we created a metadata model to start with, so that that became the standard, and all the instrument teams that uh, got the data and produced geophysical parameter type of products used that metadata model, so that every product that's produced has the associated metadata automatically generated. And we also have uh, for the for the world we have global change master directory, which. Uh, which is also part of the international directory network. So there, there's a lot of controlled vocabulary generation there as well. There's a scientific process by which, uh, the science community involved process by which the keywords are uh, determined. Does that answer your question? Okay. Would you like to address uh, some of your I'm afraid there's not a whole lot for me to add, unfortunately. Um, our <laughs> Our metadata librarian <laughs> departed soon after the data had been finished uh, and we, we'd finished digitizing the data. Um, uh, there's minimal metadata that we actually had to begin with for these tapes. Um, some of the boxes and the cans that the tapes were in had dates. Um, some of them had dates crossed off. <laughs> so what do you do with that? Um, so it will be a process. We, we're, um, you know, we sort of have a trend. 
the University of Iowa and I think in other places of crowdsourcing some of the creation of metadata. Um, so there is an intent, although it's a bit fuzzy at this point, it's still just an intent, um, to outsource or to crowdsource some of the, the creation of the metadata. As you heard in the clip that I played, the station operators identified their locations and the dates and the times. Um, so uh, getting that information um, would help us to correlate that with the orbital ephemeris data set. Um, but I think we're still a ways off from, um, from having uh, what I would call a robust metadata for these tapes. Um, we, I suppose we have, a, we have an interesting set of, of metadata issues because the database is compiled from multiple data sources, some of which come from work that the uh, PIs did, but also some of which comes from literature. So in some ways, the, the database as, it's, as a whole could be described uh, with metadata and with various controlled vocabularies. But each table in the database itself could also have its own descriptive metadata and scientific metadata attached to it. And so, and some of it, in fact, uh, does have links back to the literature from which, uh, from which it was derived. Uh, so one of the things we have to think about is w at, at what level of sort of granularity are we going to carry out sort of descriptive work and what would be you know, what would be an appropriate metadata schema and, and controlled vocabulary for these different parts? Uh, and then also, where will we, uh, you know, what will be the source of that metadata? Some of it's already embedded in the database, but some of it would probably have to be, in a sense, recovered by, by a, like, oral history with the, uh, with the creators of the database. Um, I believe there is an astronomy thesaurus, um, which could be used, uh, perhaps, for some of the, some subject, uh, Description. Thank you. I think I saw it. I think there was. Somebody else. Oh, yeah. It was uh, uh, for Emily. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about sending the getting media preserved for these kinds of tapes. Mm -hmm. um, are, so were they just audio that you were getting digitized, or was it that you're talking about the tables too? Um, so the audio data, yes, was. <laughs> The audio data ooh, <laughs> was indeed digitized uh, by the Media Preserve. Um, we didn't, nobody knew exactly what it should sound like, really. Um, so fortunately, one of the surviving, one of the last surviving members of Van Allen's research team, George Ludwig, um, was able to sort of listen to the first, the, the, the couple, couple tapes we sent as pilots um, to confirm, well, yeah, that is about what it should sound like. Um, but uh, the other, I'm sorry, the other piece of your question? Um, no, I was asking um, also, were these computer tapes or there were film, there were audio reels? Because they look like computer cartridges. They're audio reels. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. yeah, they were. Um, the orbital ephemeris data set that I referred to that had been digitized by Google was produced, you know, there's some missing pieces of the story that were sort of trying to piece together now. You know, the data is analyzed at the University of Iowa by a small army of graduate students. Um, and then I, what I'm not certain about yet is how the data got from that, from there to this, this uh, report produced by Goddard you know, f three or four years later. Um, so there may be another data set somewhere um, that sort of compiles all of that, um, that then produced the orbital ephemeris that was published. Um, and so there's a lot of like analog to digital, the analog to the sort of back and forth. Of these. Any other question? Please raise your hand so I can see. Yes. Um, so my question is about uh, sort of levels of what you keep. So in, um, I think it was Deirdre's talk, she talked about the different, um, as you go higher in the stack, you get these more sort of expert created products. Um, do you, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you see those as different or similar in terms of their, their own preservation requirements down the line. I know that at my institution, I could envision people saying, well, we just want to keep the final product. We don't want to keep all that data that's taking up so much space. And is, you know, so that raw data that needs the experts to reinterpret it every time versus the product at the end. And thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm live or not. Okay. Uh, so we keep everything. And it's very important to keep everything. Um, it's, it's just like, it's actually very much like archaeology. When they're doing a dig, they always preserve some stuff undug because they're going to have better techniques in years to come, and they recognize that. So we, we understand that there will be 
better calibrations and methods coming down the pike than are available to us now. And so, in fact, I would say uh, the, the most vital part of our mission is preserving the, the low-level data. Um, so, but um, and in terms of, you know, as we go up into derived products and things, um, we treat them the same. They're accessions that, you know, they get the same level of metadata on them and the same kind of preservation. We have a, a fairly robust system with um, versioning both for data and versioning for metadata. So it's not uncommon for those higher level products to, to be versioned and superseded and things like that, but they're all there. So, um, but no, the, um, it's extremely important to, to preserve the low level data with sufficient metadata that they can be reanalyzed. Trevor, yes. Thanks. Um, I was excited in Rama's talk to see software show up on the list of things that is packaged together in how you guys are thinking about sort of what's needed to make the data useful in the future. So I was just curious if you could say a bit about what, what constitutes software in that case and how you're sort of bundling it together. Okay. Well, um, in the case of, uh, well, as Deirdre was saying, we do have different levels of products starting with level zero, which is the raw data, and level one, calibrated, uh, uh, radiometrically and geometrically calibrated data. And then level two are geophysical parameters that are information derived from these data. And then, again, higher level products where uh, things are uh, uh, put on a common grid and standard, standard grid temporally as well as spatially. And then uh, multiple products combined to produce level four products. So all these products have uh, we, we, what we define, what we call standard products, which are um, uh, uh, peer-reviewed and community-accepted algorithms are used for producing these. So that's, those algorithms have software. And the software has source code. And our idea is, in order to preserve the understandability of the data, you need to know exactly what was done to produce any given, per, give, any given product at any given level. So in our, even if the software source code, well, software executable may not execute 30 years from now, the source code is the one that says exactly how these products were produced. Therefore, for understandability, it's very important to keep the source code. That's, that's, that was the point I was making there. I had a question there. Yes. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I, want, I had kind of two somewhat related points. One is just, I saw recently from NASA that there was an RFP that was put out around uh, planetary science data, and it had a rather broad scope. It, it was kind of around innovation in general, focused on access and, and management and preservation, but it, it explicitly called out kind of data management, preservation, and access as, as aims of, of the RFP, which, which was really exciting. Um, and as, as we looked at that and, and we reached out to others to try to find partners uh, because we are experts in archiving and preservation, whereas we, we wanted to find people that were you know, planetary science experts so we could talk about the needs for tools to be developed. And what we found is, is what I think was touched on a little bit in the talk is, is the, um, one of the big disconnects or challenges is, is, well, is the disconnects between communities. How do you bridge that gap at different terminology, different aims, different um, backgrounds and contexts? So, I guess I was, I'm interested to hear a little bit about how you think we can, what's the evolving nature of, of bridging that gap between communities and, and kind of if you could talk a little bit about what the fo folks like us can do in, in this room to, to, you know, to, to reach out to uh, those in the sciences to, and I think there's a lot of people in this room that already do that, but, but I think we have a, a long way to go before we are where we would like to be. So I think this question is a broader question and could be addressed by just almost everybody in the panel. So we can start from here, Deidre. This closes to me. No, I don't have a clue. <laughs> 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 um, I, I mean, I spend so much of my waking time thinking about ways to serve our designated communities, right? That uh, I very rarely go beyond that. I, I do think there are emerging standards across disciplines and that's a very hopeful thing. Um, and people are realizing the value of standards um, but that's just not even on my radar, I have to say, sadly. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll have to agree <laughs> in that uh, frustration. Uh, generally, we do have, in terms of uh, how do we, how, 
we focus on connecting our users, scientific users, or scientific or other users with the uh, archive centers, data archiving, data act, uh, distributed active archive centers, or DACs. And each of the DACs has a user services group which understands the data and he is able to explain the data to a novice user or point them to people who can explain them well. So that's uh, from the point of view of making the data more useful to the community. In terms of how to bring technologists together with the scientific users, I think it's actually NASA puts out these calls and uh, encourages, uh, en encourages such, such communication, but I'm not sure what more can be done. It's really not my expertise, so. So bef uh, before I go on, could I engage both of you on, uh, there may be other question. NASA has this, uh, you're familiar with NEXT, which is NASA Earth Exchange, which is the first big data experiment they are trying to do with large EOS, uh, EOS right. based data sets. So the, the, the experiment is to be able to take the data sets itself the software, the work processes, the flows, and all together in order to give uh, the, across the board, of course, the first would be subject matter expertise who, who have the expertise to be able to use that. But the goal is to be able to move from just being domain specific to all across. And perhaps that could go in that direction. I don't know, I'm not an expert, but I thought I'd bring that to your, would you like to share about the next? Um. Well, you explain what NEXT as a program okay. does, so um, I don't think I have much to add to that. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, on a, I suppose, a, more, a smaller, more local scale, um, my hires up uh, had some skepticism when I told them that I was reaching out to the physics department to ask for their help with this project. Um, they didn't think that the meeting could possibly go well, <laughs> um, but they did. Um, you know, the, the physicists were very uh, uh, grateful and eager to, to help us um, understand the data um, and grateful that we were preserving a legacy, not only of their field, but of their department in our university. Um, how we translate that to work with more current data, um, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, I think there's a lot to be said for sitting down and having some cookies together <laughs> and talking about what you're working on. Um, uh, you know, if we had tried to conduct it all over email, I don't think anything would have happened. Um, but actually sitting down and, and, and talking through and sort of walking through where we were and revealing um, our expertise and the things that we were concerned with, but also our, um, where we were sort of inexpert and needed their guidance. Um, has produced, I think, a really um, excellent partnership that I hope will continue uh, in some other projects as well. Gar? And I, I think for, um, hello, I think, I think for us at the University of Maryland, um, we did a lot of, a lot of research data services and a lot of outreach. Um, and so uh, we actually were approached by these researchers because they'd seen a little piece in our uh, library newsletter thing about how we can you know, assist researchers with research data, bring us your problems, and so they're the ones who showed up with this. I think a lot of our discussions though, as we kind of alluded to in the talk, um, they were very eager to work with us and to provide the, the, the database uh, and to kind of give it, a, give it a home, a more sort of guaranteed home than the just server that's in their own office. Um, but I think the, our approach to curating this was at times seen as sort of like unne unnecessary formalities, you know, because um, if, with sort of the sharing aspect of the, the uh, astronomy research culture, it was just, well, you know, we have this database, we just want to give it to you, you know, we don't need like any kind of formal agreement or whatever, because if you were another researcher, I would just give it to you, like th that isn't really how this works. And so kind of trying to explain where we were coming from, sort of that sort of provenance angle, well, you know, appropriately describing everything and kind of how you know, we uh, shared goals and we still want to do all the same things, but we need to make sure that you can understand the data 20 years from now, I think was, was beneficial for us. I, I actually thought of something, and this is probably not the, the direction that the, the questioner was going, but one of the things that I've ended up doing is I've gotten very involved in satellite mission planning. So I've reached out to the engineers <laughs> and said things like, 
let's send a checksum with every file. <laughs> and let's verify every file transfer between systems so that we have provenance from the time the data come down from the spacecraft. And they're like, oh, well, that's a good idea. So um, in that sense, definitely we're, we're trying to you know, work our way into NOAA to, to see that, that provenance is strengthened all the way through the, through the chain. Um, and that, that is, there is a huge cultural difference. I was told that I had too many ISO acronyms and standards in my first few talks. And I said, well, you know, do you care if this antenna is 14 meters long or 14 centimeters? That, that's a standard that you use, right? <laughs> you know? So I'm going to show you my units of measure and things like that. And um, it's taken a few years, but I think it's been very successful. Any, any other question, please? Uh, if I can. Yes. Anything with anything that they have to do with to prepare their data, or something that you mentioned about the the burdens of curating the data. Um, well, I mean, the, the library community has sort of studied this uh, over the last few years and done a lot of um, surveys and interviews with researchers to try and understand, you know, the extent to which uh, curatorial work is is sort of an additional burden, um, and the general picture. I think that emerges from a lot of that research is that um, the researchers recognize the value of, of sort of uh, sort of data management and curation and and you know, capturing things like provenance and, and digital preservation and this kind of stuff, but uh, really don't have necessarily the time, right? Given the the sort of career incentives that they have, so um, it's it's not quite clear that it's a burden because it's you know it's it's sort of technically different from what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it, that may be the case for some researchers. Some are obviously very sophisticated when it comes to data management. So where exactly that, the, the, any, a burden might be for any one researcher, I think, is, is going to vary a little bit. Um, in our case, what Robin described was simply that uh, you know, the notion for us is that curation is a very sort of policy-driven thing, and it has um, a certain uh, decisions have to be made and, and steps have to be taken. Uh, and that, that seemed, I think, uh, a little bit overly bureaucratic to the researchers that we were working with. But, um, but I, I, I don't think that they, I, I, I think that they still understood that it that was valuable and worth, worth doing. So one, one more last question, otherwise I'll hold that question for myself. So please feel free to raise your hand if you. So one, I have a couple of them, and one is for the NOVA. It's about the GODAR project, which you are, GODAR, for those who are not familiar, is called Go Global Oceanographic Data Archaeology Rescue Project. And uh, a significant uh, data recovery work was carried out, and you can probably find more information on NODC website than from me. So my question is to Deirdre, is all the recovery work that has been done, how, what kind of preservation plans are now in place for it to be uh, maintained as well as pr access being provided long term from both preservation as well as access perspective. Would you comment on that? Well, w basically, you know, the big goal of Godar is to get the data into digital format if it's not already there, um, and to provide as much metadata as we can possibly collect about it. Once once it's in that format, it's treated just like any other in situ data. I mean, it's essentially indistinguishable. Um, so it's it's. It's there, it's accessible. It's, um, much of it is in um, the w uh, World Ocean Database, which is a, the largest database of ocean profile data. Okay. So in the same line, uh, for specialized projects where rescues have been done, whether from Iowa or from University of Maryland, how do you envision these uh, unique, uh, historically valuable scientific data sets to be preserved on long term? Do you plan to be integrated? I think somebody mentioned about NSSDC, uh, National Space Science Data Center, and does University of Maryland envision being also integrated with other large scientific data sets? And do you envision using the OIS model, which is an actively used by NASA, NOAA, and many libraries all over? Would you like to comment? In, uh, in our case, we uh, might not be long-term, so it's still a little bit up in the air, but we're, uh, short, short term in an astronomy sense, so like a few decades possibly, so 20, 30 years, that kind of thing. Um, in talking to the researchers, uh, they were more interested in 
making sure that it was still usable until something better came along. And they sort of had this assumption that something better probably would come along again in maybe 20, 30, 40 years or something. So they were never intending for this to be indefinite, which is part of what made it a good test case for us in that sense. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to thank all the speakers and won't hold you from your lunch. Thank you very much. Individual questions, please feel free to ask them. They will be here during lunch. Thanks. Thanks to our panel. And, um, yeah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.